Welcome back to Questing Beast. I'm Ben. Today we're taking a look at Castles in Tillin, which is an adventure module for levels one through six. So this is an adventure which my patrons have requested quite a few times that I take a look at. So we'll be going through it today. Um, it is written by Gabor Lux, is I think how you pronounce his name. And it reads, The immense rambling complex of Castles in Tillin has stood in its mountain valley for many years. Built over several generations, it has now been deserted by its former owners and left to time and the elements. However, that is not the end of the story, for Zintillin's fabulous treasures and Machiavellian death traps continue to fascinate the fortune seekers of a dozen lands, and never mind the ghost stories. So this is suitable for one-off expeditions, so you can use it as a one-shot, just walk into the castle, try and uh, grab some treasure and get out again. Um, but it also works for extended play quite well, because it is a large mega dungeon. There is a lot to explore there. There are secrets, there are tons of characters to interact with. And it has a great combination of the macabre and the whimsical, which is exactly the tone that I tend to like in my D&D. Uh, while I was reading through this, it did remind me quite a bit of some of the adventures by uh, Gavin Norman from Dolmenwood. It had a similar tone, I think it would mesh really well with that setting. Um, this video is brought to you by my patrons over on Patreon. Uh, we had a lot of people sign up to support the channel recently, so I will be doing uh, shout outs at the end of the video, but thank you to all of my patrons for their support. And as usual, there are links down in the description below for where you can find a copy of this for yourself um, or support the channel if you so choose. I like how on the inside cover, we have the end papers being used for a large map. This is the main floor of Castles in Tillin, and it has a lot of the main characters that you can run into also marked on the map. That's really nice. Um, the rooms are not just numbered, they are also named, which is a great touch because it gives you a much clearer overview of what you're going to be getting into if you can see what the purpose of each room is. Now, if we look at the back cover, or the back end papers, we see that we have the rest of the maps here. Uh, I think these are some of the upper floors or possibly some of the uh, lower ones as well. Here's the dungeon um, with some more characters that you can meet. So this is a quite large and detailed adventure. I can't go through the whole thing just because there's uh, many, many rooms out there, many rooms in the adventure, but I can give you my general impressions. We start off with the Hall of Heroes. Um, so still kicking. So these are some of the PCs that have had adventures inside this module. So th these are the ones that have survived and some of the ones that uh, bit the dust along with what killed them. I thought that was a really funny touch. The art is a mix of what looks like public domain art, along with uh, art by uh, Peter Mullen, who I love, a uh, great old school artist, uh, Dennis McCarthy and Stefan Poag, I think is how you say his name. Uh, both Peter Mullen and Stefan Poag uh, are illustrators that have done a lot of work for Dungeon Crawl Classics. So it does have a little bit of that tone. And I think uh, their work really stands out the most because it really captures that old school feel while having a uh, kind of comedic element to it as well, where it doesn't take itself too seriously. Uh, at the beginning, we have a uh, nearby town, which is pretty traditional when you're dealing with a mega dungeon, because if you're running a mega dungeon, you're gonna need to have players get out of the dungeon, go back somewhere, drop off their treasure, level up, maybe get more hirelings, and then head back again. So you need to have that base of operations. Uh, this has a number of interesting buildings in here. Um, the Prefect, the Cat House, the Chimera Apothecary, the Church of St. Boniface, and the Three Testaments, and so on. Um, it's done in a fairly straightforward kind of Helvetica font uh, that's very easy to read. And we have these little uh, indents and these bullet points that point out important stuff. That, along with the bolding, does make it quite easy to read. Um, and you can easily pick out the most important stuff as you go along. So the format is quite well done. Um, the actual construction of the book is also excellent. It looks like it is done with a, a stitched binding, which is that stitched binding that we're always looking for. It makes the book much stronger, sturdier. It's going to last longer than glued binding. The pages are less likely to fall out. So really happy with the way it feels. Uh, the rumor mill. So we have, let's see, 12 times 3. So 36 possible rumors that could be true, false, or partially true. Some rules for running morale because hirelings are a part of any uh, old school dungeon campaign. We have some random companion quirks that you can roll up to give your hirelings extra flavor. Some random curios, 
and then we start getting into Castle Zintillan itself, along with some important features that you should know ahead of time. So the general guidelines for what the, how the rooms work, but really the campaign dynamics over here are what stand out. Um, so while the Malavols, that's the family that used to own the castle and which now still haunts it, were never a bunch of overly concerned about their kin or interlopers in their chateau, there are obviously limits where the more powerful family members will plan countermeasures add an infraction point to the company's name on the following conditions. So you are actually free to mess around in the castle pretty freely. There's dangerous stuff in there, but the family won't unite against you unless you really start messing stuff up. So if you just start going on a killing spree, killing a lot of them, um, or other stuff like you abscond with a particularly important family heirloom, or you behave in a particularly uncouth or boorish manner, includes all too clever, too boring exploration strategies. And you can also get some uh, get back in their good graces by doing stuff like uh, getting thoroughly trashed, um, a pact is struck with an influential family member, and so on. So there is a faction play element going on there where you want to not mess around with the family too badly unless you really have a lot of force on your side. Or you will be dealing with a lot of high-level NPCs, many of whom are magical, just coming after you throughout the adventure, and you really don't want that. And we have an interesting table right here, uh, the Table of Terror. Roll on this D12 table if a character or companion panics and makes a run for the nearest exit. The roll should always be granted even under the most dire circumstances. So there's a lot of terrifying things in here, um, but the Mega Dungeon is not, I mean, it's large, but it's not deep underground. So it's never too unreasonable that someone would be able to make a run for it, head down a hall and get out a side door. Uh, so you're always going to have a chance of escaping if you just run for it. Although you could just be consumed by the restless dead or thou art lost and seen nevermore. But possibly something could end up like you uh, return safely but changed or you return with the memory of a great discovery. So there's possible benefits as well. We start getting into the um, actual room descriptions here with uh, the grounds. And one slight quibble I have with the way that it's formatted is just that um, when you have each separate room, it's done with like A7, A8, A9, but it's not really, it is bolded, but a lot of other things that are on the margin are also bolded. So the when a new room is starting, it doesn't stand out as clearly as I would like. Um, maybe if it had ha like extra large font or something like that, uh, it would have been a little bit easier to see, oh, I'm in a new room now. Um, I really like, however, how the maps are repeated inside the book along with the room descriptions. So you never really have to flip to the front of the book. You are usually have a zoomed in section of the map pretty close to uh, wherever it is that you're reading. You're never more than a couple of pages away, right? So A, the grounds area is just on these two pages and you can immediately see what you're dealing with there. Move on to the servant's wing. And again, you're never too far away from what you need to see. So that's really nice. I really appreciate that. It keeps uh, the Game Master understanding the context of the room that they're in and what's nearby. So that it's never just like you're in this abstract room and players say, I go through the door. The Game Master has to try and remember like where they are relative to everything else. It's like, no, I can see right on this map what's going to be nearby. I can even predict or plan out for possible events and ways that the players are going to go. Um, I really love how nearly every room inside this mega dungeon has something fun in it. Uh, there is very few, if any, just empty rooms where there's just nothing there, which is pretty typical in a lot of old uh, mega dungeons. It, it's a, a adventure. It's a castle full of whimsy and full of just things to poke, which is my favorite style of playing D and D. Um, there's people to talk to. There's traps. There's just a weird magic item. There is just strange events like you hear a banging coming from inside a closet and you open it up and there's a guy that's tied up in there. And so you release him and he says, ah, I'm free. The curse is lifted. And he steps out of the, um, out of the cabinet and then just turns to ash into a pile on the floor. Clearly he had been cursed so that he could not leave the cabinet. Things like that are just all over the place, just little laughs. Um, and I really enjoyed that. It's fun to read. You can pick almost any room and there's gonna be something entertaining there. What do we got here? Let's pick one at random. Uh, the lounge. So severed heads are set on the couches, snarling at intruders. Harmless. A card table in the center is lit by a glowing globe suspended overhead. A monumental tapestry forms a greatly embellished chronicle of the Malavoles, omitting the less savory details. Little here is factual or even tangentially related to the truth. 
a line of kings holds musical instruments, it, holding inst musical instruments is seen on an old wooden carving. So some details about that. We just go to the indents here or the bullet points. A gloved hand deals cards on a table, but cheats deviously. If beaten at its game, a hidden compartment slides open containing 3d6 times 50 gold pieces. If the character loses, save, or is decapitated by an invisible sword. Players love playing games within games, so that's really fun. Uh, kings play old ballads if approached, including one about the hero Roland, who had lost his fiery heart. So every room just has something fun. I'll just flip through it here. Like I said, there is just so much information packed into this thing. Um, no matter what direction players are going to wander in, they're going to find something entertaining or frightening or funny to encounter. So it's a really high density of ideas and density of encounters, which I appreciate. We have the Summer Wing. The Lake Tower. Let's flip through it here. The whole section for just the room descriptions is a solid 100 pages long, approximately. And we have, I don't know, three to four rooms per page. So that's a lot of content. You can run this for possibly years. But a one shot works just as well because you can just pop in, go through some of the rooms, see what you got, and then pop back out again. Let's get to the back of the book where we can see some of the uh, content there. This is fun. There's like a whole poem that you can find and copy this out and give it to your players. We have the oubliette. Eventually you get down to the dungeon. The indoor nest. This is a fun little region. So there is, let me see if I can find a good map of it. I think it's further on. There is a section. Oh, here we go. There is a section of the uh, castle where you can find an entire sort of pocket universe. There's a whole forest inside the castle somewhere where it's you know bigger on the inside so there's no way you could have a forest in here and if you explore uh, along these paths like you go out this way you come back into the bottom so it's sort of like a globe that you can't really escape but it has its own encounters its own ecology its own rules and you can just have adventures there for a while before you escape back to the castle the rogues gallery is the random encounter table so normally you would find a random encounter table near the beginning of the book but the reason that it's back here is that it's long and detailed. Uh, the first 60 or so entries, I like how these numbers are much bigger. So I kind of wish the rooms uh, were labeled like that. Um, but the first 60 or so of these are just family members of the Malleville family. Weird, eccentric, generally evil, um, undead, living, sort of dead uh, characters that you can run into. They all have their own motivations. Uh, some of them can be manipulated. Some of them will immediately try and fight you. So you have all sorts of fun things that you can run into. Of course, smart players will even not only make uh, allies of them, but possibly try and find ways to turn them against each other. Let's pick one at random here. Uh, Roberto Malavol the Arbiter, a bearded ghost in judge's black robes, wears golden pegasus brooch around the neck. Uh, two in three, waves company out of the way. One in three, stops to see if they are involved in some wrongdoing. That's great. Just a little encounter, right? So you can just watch this regal ghost float by, or he might stop and interrogate you. If you roll higher than 60, though, because you generally are rolling a D100, you're going to start running into you know, more uh, typical undead and the, the other denizens of the castle, like creeping vines, goatresses, hand swarms, uh, masked murderers, razzle-dazzles, rigo mortis, which is a kind of a skeleton. Uh, desiccated wheezing skeletons, yeah. So all sorts of fun things to spice stuff up. And we have a whole section on the treasury here. Lots of weird magic items. Let's just pick one at random here. Uh, magic turnips. Each of these turnips grow into an enormous specimen overnight if planted and watered. The size will usually fit a wheelbarrow, but there is a 1 in 10 growth, 1 in 10 chance the growth will be exponential. So you get a massive super turnip, kind of like a James and the Giant Peach, I guess. We have a more detailed, a little bit clearer version of the whole ground floor map. And then of course we have the upper and lower floor maps. Even more dungeon maps. And some uh, a little ad for other books put out by the same publisher. And uh, there we go. 
Uh, this is a really fun looking adventure. This is exactly the sort of thing that I would run. I love the tone. Like I said, it feels like it would mesh really well with Dolmenwood, where it's a little bit scary, but also a little bit whimsical and doesn't take itself too seriously. So there's a lot of fun to be had and not just death traps. And I really like that whenever I'm playing D&D. Um, as usual, links are down in the description below where you can check this out for yourself if you enjoyed it and you think that you would, uh, you and your players would like to play it. Thanks for watching, everybody. Uh, quick shout outs now to some of the new patrons over on Patreon, including Derek Sibling, Jason Blasso, Miscast Terrain. Now, by the way, Miscast Terrain has a really great YouTube channel uh, looking at how to make terrain and miniature design. And he's even working on a game uh, or a version of Nave. Uh, which is why he caught my attention. So he's really great. Check out his channel. Um, also, new patrons D, Alexander McConnell, Linus Nilsson, Stephen D. Clow, Wallace Baker, Lynn Zolf, Anthony Parata, Stell Quinnett, Christian Mahar, uh, Nicholas Beer, Riddle Jacks, Kyle Knott, Hampus Legion, and Ken Christian. Thanks to everyone for supporting the channel, and thanks for watching. I'll see you guys next time.